Uh, I'm going to start with just some general principles, uh, things to be aware of uh, for success in any uh, gardening endeavor. Okay, and then we're going to talk about variety selection uh, and then move on to the topic of cultural care. And that'll be all about how to get your uh, tomatoes off to a good start. We're going to go on to talk about um, avoiding common problems. Uh, that people experience when growing their tomatoes. We're gonna to talk about uh, pests and how to manage pests. And then finally, we'll wrap up with uh, some discussion about some possible diseases that you might experience and what to do about them, how to prevent them. So I'm gonna start with the four foundations of success. Uh, I know many of you have probably watched uh, uh, the webinars we've been giving over the last couple of years, and you frequently see this slide. We keep coming back to it because we really want to emphasize how important it is that you pay attention to maintaining healthy soil, water properly, uh, maintain proper aeration in your soils, and uh, have the proper uh, sun exposure. Those are really fundamental. Uh, to any successful garden. And I'm gonna talk about them uh, in order, but pretty specifically with respect to what uh, you should be considering on each of these topics when you're planning to plant and raise tomatoes. Uh, soil is really uh, the basis of a successful garden. If your soil is healthy, it's going to lead to much better results. Got to keep in mind that soil is not just dirt. Soil is home to life. Uh, it's just full of uh, critters that you can see, like the earthworms. But uh, more importantly, from the point of view of the health of your plants, the microorganisms, uh, it's teeming with millions and millions of uh, beneficial fungi and bacteria that interact with your plants probably all remember from uh, biology classes back in junior high school uh, that the plants uh, photosynthesize and produce sugars that produce energies that help the plants grow. Well, what I don't remember learning at that point, but I certainly learned it as a master gardener, is that the plants are producing those sugars not only for themselves, but to share with the microorganisms. Uh, they do that to attract the microorganisms because the microorganisms actually break down nutrients in the soil uh, to make them available to your plants. So in order to have healthy plants, you've got to have healthy soils. So what do you do when you're uh, getting ready to plant your tomatoes? Well, the condition of your uh, current soils is important. And the present condition is gonna really depend on how you've been treating your garden beds in the past. Um, if you grew uh, winter vegetables, some of the nutrients may at this point be depleted. Uh, if on the other hand, you chose to do some cover crops, uh, you may find actually that the cover crops have done their job and a lot of the nutrients are already present. So start by doing a soil test. If you've never tested uh, your soils at all, I recommend that you do a soil test with a commercial lab. If you go to our website or if you get the handout from this presentation, you'll have a link that will take you to a list of soil testing labs uh, that we know do good jobs of testing uh, the soil for home gardeners. Uh, and it's really worthwhile doing, and it might surprise you. It surprised me. About uh, probably seven, eight years ago, I redid my raised beds and I filled them with imported soils. And I grew uh, uh, gardens successfully year round for about three years. And then I did a soil test. And it didn't surprise me that uh, the nitrogen was low. And I had been growing winter vegetables. It was now springtime, time to plant summer crops and the nitrogen needed to be supplemented. But really what surprised me was that the phosphorus in my soil 
was very, very high. In fact, excessive. And what I discovered was that I had just been doing what I think a lot of gardeners do and getting out a broad spectrum of fertilizer and spreading it in my garden beds without really thinking whether I needed all of those nutrients. Uh, nitrogen gets used by all uh, plants to produce the green. Uh, with your vegetable crops, the phosphorus, the P, and uh, potassium, the K, in NPK is also important. Uh, nitrogen, though, in addition to being used by plants, it tends to be uh, more water soluble and can easily leach out, particularly over the winter months if we get rain, like the heavy rains we got last fall and into December. Uh, that can really wash out the nitrogen, but the phosphorus and potassium moves out more slowly. It's important that you know what your soils need because excess amount of nutrients can be as uh, hard on your plants as having too little. So start by testing. If you don't want to invest in a, a commercial lab, at least do a home test. Uh, some examples are on the screen. We're not endorsing any particular products. You'll find them online. You'll find them at the nurseries, the big box stores. Just don't use one that's been sitting in your cabinet or your uh, supplies for five or six years. They do have a limited shelf life. And some of you may decide that you're going to uh, need room for another tomato or two, particularly after you look at the list of 80 plus tomatoes we'll be uh, selling at the Great Tomato Plant Sale. And you might decide you're going to do some containers. Uh, if you've uh, used containers before and you've had successful crops, and if you didn't uh, grow tomatoes or any other plants in the same plant family, like peppers or eggplants in that container, you can probably reuse it to grow a tomato this year. But do a soil test, at least one with the home, sale to, uh, uh, home soils test uh, product so you know what it needs. May need to be rejuvenated with a little uh, nutrients added. But if you're starting from scratch, there's a couple possibilities. I do lots of containers because I live in a townhouse and I have limited gardening space. Uh, I've, for the past dozen years, have used the same recipe. It's uh, three ingredients, compost, uh, coconut coir, and perlite in equal amounts. The compost, I usually either use compost I've made myself or a good one that I've purchased I tend to want to have some chicken manure in it because that's a real good source of additional nitrogen. Uh, so take uh, uh, one third um, is going to be composed of compost. Uh, coconut coir is a byproduct of the coconut industry. Uh, the reason I use it is um, if you see on the screen the brick, that's a common way that um, it is sold in large bricks. I like the ones that are about the size of a house brick. And if you take that uh, brick of coconut coir, you put it in a five gallon bucket that's about two thirds full of water. Uh, you let it sit for two or three hours, stir it up a little bit. It's going to absorb most of that water. And that's one of the reasons I like to use it in a potting mix for a container. It really holds and retains water. 15 times its weight uh, it can absorb and hold on to. And that means that the uh, potting mix that you're making and using in your containers is not going to dry out as quickly. Uh, perlite. Uh, perlite is going to uh, keep the mix from getting uh, too compacted. It's going to keep the aeration, the air spaces that are necessary. Uh, uh, when you use it, be sure you put on your mask. All of us have got them uh, easily available these days. And the reason for that is uh, when it's dry, it puts out a lot of dust and you don't want to inhale that dust. Uh, but once it gets uh, some water from the excess water that's going to be in your coconut bar, uh, you can mix it together uh, all in a larger container, mix it well, and then that will be a good start. 
you shouldn't have to add any additional nutrients, any additional fertilizers to that new mix until your tomatoes have grown up to the point where they're starting to produce fruit. And then in a, a little bit later, we'll talk about fertilizing at that later stage. Uh, the alternative is to buy some good potting mix. Uh, be sure you read the label. Uh, the uh, kind of things you're likely to find uh, in a commercial potting mix, maybe you'll find coconut coir. More and more frequently, I am seeing coconut coir. But traditionally, what has been the foundation of the commercial mixes is peat moss. Peat moss develops in bogs. It takes centuries, uh, so it's uh, really not as sustainable as the coconut coir. As long as we're continuing to harvest the coconuts for the coconut oil, coconut water, et cetera, uh, the coconut coir will be available. The bigger problem that I've been focusing on recently with the peat moss is that the harvesting process releases large quantities of carbon dioxide. Uh, as the peat forms, it really sequesters a lot of carbon. And when harvested, that all gets released. Uh, so I personally have chosen to um, avoid using peat moss whenever possible. So I prefer one where its bases might be uh, coconut coir instead. Uh, other kind of things that you're gonna find uh, in the mix uh, that probably will uh, have some kind of maybe uh, shredded uh, pine bark, sometimes perlite or vermiculite, uh, sometimes things like compost, mushroom compost seems to be uh, fairly popular, or it might just say uh, composted forest products. And that's probably going to mean everything from sawdust to wood chips, uh, broken up pieces of bark and wood chips uh, that are part of the milling process from lumber, all gets mixed together, composted for a while, and used in commercial mixes. Those are all good things to look for. What I would avoid is any of the mixes that come pre-mixed with uh, chemical-based fertilizers. And the reason is those chemical-based uh, fertilizers are highly water-soluble, not only the nitrogen, but all of the other nutrients. And it's easily leached out as you water your containers, particularly if you're not using uh, the kind of uh, containers that have a reservoir. If it's just draining out the bottom, you're losing a lot of nutrients. So an organic-based uh, uh, fertilizer will help avoid that problem. Watering, really important for tomatoes. Uh, when we get into some of the common problems, you're gonna hear more than once that the cause can be based on erratic, inconsistent watering. When you're watering uh, the tomatoes, don't think of it as watering individual plants. You should be watering the soil because your real goal with your irrigation is to keep the microorganisms and the soil healthy uh, because that's going to be the basis for the success of your plants. So water the soil, not the plants. What does that mean? That means that if you're gonna use drip irrigation, uh, have your drip lines running the whole length of your garden beds. Uh, these appear to be maybe uh, eight to 10 inches apart and they go across the bed and the water comes out through the uh, drip holes all along that uh, whole length. If you simply uh, put some uh, uh, individual drippers, two or three at the base of the tomato, uh, the tomato is going to get the water that it needs, but the soil won't. The other thing, uh, test it. Uh, tomatoes are fairly deeply rooted. Um, in fact, if they've got the right conditions, they may go six feet or so below the ground. But most of the roots that are supplying the plant with nutrients and with water and with air are going to be in the top 12 to 24 inches of the soil. And that's where you want to be sure the water is penetrating. In my personal experience, um, I was really surprised because I, 
I had seen a lot of the common tomato problems year after year. At that point, I was running a drip system uh, with the, uh, uh, the water going the whole distance of the garden. But what I was doing was I was running it for a short amount of time, 20 to 30 minutes, depending on uh, the temperature, et cetera, um, every day. When I switched that, so I was watering every other day, but twice as long. So now 20 to, or 40 to 60 minutes a day. What happened is that allowed more water to come out penetrate deeper into uh, my soils. Uh, it uh, helped retain the water and the, the uh, moisture that it needed at the root level. Uh, and I avoided a lot of those problems. So if you're having some of the problems we'll talk about later that I tell you that are water-based, think about uh, being sure you're getting adequate moisture in the root zone. Uh, test it. You can use a water meter that uh, has prongs that go down uh, 12 inches or so and can test the, the water level there. Or frankly, since you're watering all of the soil, just pick an area that's some distance from your plants so you're not disturbing their roots too much. Dig down, take some soil in your hand, uh, squeeze it together. If it holds together the way it's shown in the uh, photo here, uh, it's got enough water. If it's just crumbly dry, it needs more water. And if it's oozing water, you're probably giving your plants too much water. Then be sure to mulch because that's going to help retain moisture in your soils as well. I like to use a straw mulch that I buy at a seed store. Just go on, do an internet uh, search looking for uh, uh, seed stores, uh, uh, farm stores, and you'll be able to find supplies of hay and straw. Uh, I like the straw because it has less seeds in it in my experience. And maintain the aeration. A healthy soil has 25% of its volume in air pockets, believe it or not, 25% of what's in those garden beds should be pore spaces. Don't let those pore spaces get oversaturated with water and don't let your soil get compressed. Uh, don't walk on it. Don't let your kids or your pets walk on it and don't walk, don't work in it if it's wet. All of those things will compress the uh, air pockets out. And believe it or not, a lot of the uh, oxygen that is used in photosynthesis is accessed by the plant roots and it comes from the air that is in the plant soil. Sunlight. Uh, tomatoes, uh, they're producing big fruits and they want uh, quite a bit of sunlight. Eight to 10 hours is best. Um, if you live in the hot parts of our county, East County, like Brentwood, Antioch, or even Pleasant Hill, Central County, where I live, uh, where it gets really hot uh, come July, August, September. It's nice if you can find a place uh, in your garden where you get morning sun. So uh, crack of dawn, uh, the tomatoes are getting some sunlight, but some shade in the afternoon. So look for that. But I know many of us uh, aren't fortunate enough to have that situation. Uh, still eight to 10 will be the best. Five or six hours you can get by with if you grow cherry tomatoes. Try those if you're sun challenged. And uh, you may not get the production you would get in a sunnier location, but you probably get some production even with uh, as little as five hours of sunlight. And think about containers. Sometimes I've known people that will even move their containers during the day to get adequate sunlight. And then you've got to pick your variety. Uh, and it's going to be tough. You've got more than 80 to pick from just at our great tomato plant sale, uh, let alone, you know, all the nurseries and the big box stores already have the uh, tomatoes available. It can be hard to pick. Uh, here's some considerations you might uh, want to think about when you're picking your tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes 
all break down into two general categories, determinant and indeterminate. And it all is based on the plant's growth habit. The determinate tomatoes are only gonna grow uh, to about three feet in, tall, in height. And they're not gonna be as bushy or as uh, out of control as indeterminates can become. The indeterminate ones are just gonna keep growing until uh, the plant dies back, either because uh, of diseases or problems, or just because the weather turns too cold. The indeterminate tomatoes uh, are gonna need some kind of a support like the cages you see in the photo here, or we'll talk about some other possibilities later. Uh, determinate uh, tomatoes uh, are great for containers because of their size. Uh, but think about keeping them uh, in your garden beds as well, because they can be uh, planted more closely together. But one characteristic to know of determinate tomatoes is that they tend, generally speaking, to bear most of their fruit within a fairly short period of time, uh, four to six weeks, um, and then they'll quit producing. Uh, now, maybe that means that uh, by mid-August, you can take them out and start some other crop, uh, but the uh, indeterminate tomatoes are going to continue to produce until the weather gets too cold. Now, there are some exceptions. I grew a, a cherry tomato last year called Baby Boomer, put it on my front porch in a container. It was the first tomato that I was able to harvest last year. And I harvested as long as any of the indeterminates in my garden. So there are exceptions. Also wanna think a lot about climate. Our county has a wide variation. I used to live in Oakland where the climate was uh, more like it is in the Western part of Contra Costa County uh, with enough marine influence uh, that it was more challenging to grow many varieties of tomatoes. Um, the University of California actually has uh, categorized a lot of tomato varieties based on the climates where they'll grow well, uh, climate zones A, B, and C. Now, um, if you went to the URL that's on the slide, or if you simply take your photo right now with your camera, uh, you'll go to a website uh, for the University of California that has a real good um, article about growing tomatoes. And it includes a long list of varieties with different climate ratings. Uh, many of the tomatoes will grow in all of the uh, climates, uh, but if you live in the cooler regions of West uh, Contra Costa County, uh, over by Richmond and El Cerrito, uh, you might want to look for some for zone C, and in the hot areas, those in uh, zone B. Uh, and uh, you may get better production because they're more suited to your particular microclimate. Then the final thing to think about for varieties are heirlooms versus hybrids. Now, heirlooms doesn't have a precise definition, but generally speaking, there is agreement that an heirloom has to be a variety of tomato that has been grown for a very considerably long period of time. Uh, 40 to 50 years is, uh, is a common benchmark for them, or at least 40 to 50 years. And they have to have grown during that period and maintain the same qualities without cross-pollination with other varieties. Uh, you might be as interested to learn as I was when I first learned it as a master gardener, tomatoes don't need a pollinator. They don't need to have a bee uh, visit them. In fact, a honeybee is not capable of pollinating a tomato plant. Uh, tomato plants are usually uh, pollinated by wind action. Occasionally you might find the, the big native bumblebees uh, on your tomatoes 
and they can go from tomato to tomato uh, and different varieties and spread the pollen. But usually the tomatoes are pollinated by wind or by you shaking the plants. If they're not producing very well, try that. Uh, you're uh, playing uh, at being the wind. Uh, because they are self-pollinating, uh, for the heirloom varieties, they are able to uh, produce seeds that if you save them and grow them the next year, you will grow an identifiable, identical to the parent tomato variety, so long as they haven't accidentally been uh, cross-pollinated with another uh, variety of tomato. Hybrids um, don't have that characteristic. If you save seeds from a hybrid tomato, you won't get necessarily the same tomato growing from those seeds as the parent plant. Uh, that's because hybrids are a cross between at least two, sometimes several different varieties, and they've been intentionally cross-pollinated for certain characteristics. Sometimes it's flavor. If you're a fan of sun gold tomatoes, those wonderful little cherry tomatoes that are so sweet, uh, kids seem to really love them. They're a hybrid and they've been hybridized in a way that it really emphasizes that sweet taste. Uh, more importantly, um, if you've had trouble with diseases uh, in your garden, you may wanna give some careful consideration of using hybrids because many of the hybrids have been developed in a way that they can have some disease resistance to some of the uh, problematic diseases we'll talk about later. Okay, we're gonna talk now about getting your tomatoes planted. Um, here in Contra Costa County, uh, if you're planning to plant from seeds and you haven't gotten those seeds started yet, you better do it tomorrow. It's gonna to take eight to 10 weeks to grow those uh, tomatoes from seed inside because our soils outside and our climate outside is still too cold at night for the tomatoes to grow. Uh, so you're gonna wanna get them uh, started right away. And even then it's going to be late May, early June before you can put them in the garden, which is a little later than many of us uh, in Contra Costa County uh, plan on when we're putting our tomato seedlings in. So you might wanna start uh, with seedlings. Gotta plan your location. Um, if at all possible, uh, practice some crop rotation. If you grow tomatoes year after year in the same location, you're probably going to have a buildup over time of both diseases and you'll be attracting the pests that love the tomatoes back to that same location. If you can rotate the area where you grow them, uh, uh, it will be better for the success of your uh, crops. Uh, three or four year crop rotation is best. And unfortunately, it's not just tomatoes you have to worry about. It's anything in the same plant family. Tomatoes are in the Solanacea plant family. Sometimes it's referred to as the nightshade family and eggplant all of your peppers, both bell peppers and uh, hot peppers are in that family. Potatoes are in that family. Even petunias are in that family. So it's best to uh, skip two or three years in growing any plants uh, in your same uh, garden space. But those of us that are space challenged, uh, for my garden, I have a two year rotation. So one year I'll be growing uh, either peppers or tomatoes or a combination of both in a garden bed. Following year, I'll grow something else like green beans or uh, zucchinis. Uh, and I use a lot of hybrids as a result of that to try to uh, address some pest problems. Uh, plant spacing, uh, your determinant plants, uh, those can easily go into containers, five gallons at a minimum. 
Uh, 10 gallons or larger for the container will be better because you'll be able to provide uh, more nutrients to uh, keep the plant satisfied uh, with a little bit more uh, space. Uh, in the garden, they can probably go about 18 inches apart. If you're planting the determinants, indeterminants, the ones that spread and sprawl, if you're putting them in cages, 30 to 42 inches apart. If you're going to stake or trellis them that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, you can get more varieties uh, because they can be planted more closely together, 18 to 24 inches. Check the soil temperature. Uh, the seedlings want to have the soil temperature at least 55 degrees when measured at a depth of four to six inches below the ground surface before you put the seedlings in. Uh, starting seeds won't work because they want even higher temperatures in order to germinate. Uh, so measure your soil temperature. Uh, you can use a, a fancy soil thermometer like you see, but a instant read thermometer out of the kitchen works just as well. Uh, but look for 55 degrees. Uh, your containers, particularly if they've been uh, filled and are sitting in the sun, they're going to warm up the fastest. Uh, next will be raised beds, and the slowest to warm will be uh, planting directly in native soils in your ground, particularly if they are clay soils. Uh, I plant in containers and raised beds. Uh, containers, I'm usually able to get 55 degrees by early part of April. Uh, and the, uh, my raised beds by the middle to end of April. Uh, and uh, you might have to wait a little bit longer if you're in the native soils. Now, when you plant, uh, the day you're gonna plant them, two or three hours before you're gonna put them into the ground, uh, give them a good watering so that they uh, uh, have got plenty of moisture available uh, prior to the time you're gonna be putting them into a new location. And it's best, uh, particularly if it's a hot sunny day, wait until late in the afternoon. So you're not gonna stress them in a new location with a lot of sun. Uh, then look for a plant, uh, a seedling. Ideally, it would be about six to eight inches tall, would have a lot of leaves. Uh, they'd be nice and green looking. Uh, don't make the mistake of thinking you're gonna get a head start by buying the one at the nursery that already has blossoms on it or even uh, has set fruit already. Uh, it's gonna be stressed when you plant it into a new location and you're actually gonna have a healthier plant if you go with one that's a little smaller. Uh, when you get ready to plant it, start by cutting off the lower leaves. I've marked here with blue the leaves that I would cut off on this particular seedling. Uh, I might even cut it here to get rid of these leaves. The reason that you're going to do that is you want to plant your tomato deeply in the soil. Uh, if possible, if you can dig down deep enough, you can plant it um, vertically up and down. Uh, but if it's too leggy to do that, or if you've got something like a barrier for gophers in the bottom of your raised beds, then you might have to plant it at a little bit of a diagonal slant. Uh, but you do want to get it uh, planted deeply. Here I've put a little gold mark uh, how deep it should be planted. And what's going to happen, you see the, the uh, roots that are already here uh, coming out of the pot. Well, all of this area of the stem underground is going to also develop roots. And that's going to help the plant access the moisture, the air, and the nutrients that it needs. Uh, so plant them deeply. Uh, hopefully you've already done the soil test and you know um, if you need fertilizer, um, if you grew a cover crop that included legumes, as you may know, uh, if you chose that one, it uh, produces nitrogen in its root system. And if you cut that down, as soon as the plant started to, to bloom, 
uh, that nitrogen is all captured. And hopefully you've already done it or you, you plan to do it at least three or four weeks before you're gonna put your tomatoes in the ground. Uh, that uh, amount of time, three or four weeks will allow that nitrogen to start to be available. And you may not need to add any nitrogen. And if you're like me, you may not need to add any uh, phosphate as well, phosphorus. So um, uh, pay attention to what you need and then read the labels. This is just a small sampling of uh, different fertilizers. There's many, many more available out there. Uh, but pay attention. It's going to tell you what's in it. It has three numbers. The first one shows the amount of nitrogen. The second number is phosphorus. The third number is potassium. And uh, when you're uh, mixing it in, when you're just putting your seedlings in, frankly, you're probably better off to look with, for one with fairly low numbers rather than trying to find one that might be 15, 7, and 13. Uh, you don't want to give your tomatoes too much nitrogen. If you do, they'll uh, grow a lot of green leaves, but it will actually slow down the fruiting process and will attract pests like aphids. Okay, if you're doing indeterminants, you're going to need some kind of a support system. One possibility is cages. I picked these pictures uh, just as examples because um, one of the things that if you don't yet own tomato cages, you should think about when you purchase them is how am I going to store them? The ones on the left, there's actually three or four cages stacked in inside each other. And when you're not using them in the garden, it's really nice if they are able to stack that way or these collapse flat and it also makes storage uh, uh, more uh, easy in the uh, season where you're not using them in the garden. Uh, you'll want to have uh, cages that are five or six uh, feet tall for your indeterminate tomatoes. You can make them yourselves. Just get some of that wire mesh. It's got nice big openings, the wire mesh that you use to reinforce concrete. Uh, you can cut it yourself, make it into a cylinder, and it makes a great tomato cage. Or if you want to be able to place the plants uh, closer together, uh, think about staking or trellising your tomatoes. Uh, you can see how many uh, tomatoes are planted in this bed because they've been staked. And what you want to do is you want to insert the stake next to your seedling when you first plant the seedling. Uh, look for a sturdy stake that's about six feet tall drive it into the soil uh, several inches deep so that it will support itself. And then take a piece of twine or some piece of soft material. If you've got old t-shirts that you're not using anymore, you can easily cut those into strips that are half inch uh, wide or so. It's nice and soft. Uh, tie the young seedling at the base to the stake. And then as the tomato grows, you're going to prune it, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you're going to continue to attach the main stem at 10 to 12 inch intervals all the way up the stake uh, to hold it up and give it support. Uh, so that's staking. A similar approach is to use trellises. Uh, the trellis on the left is actually from my brother-in-law's garden. That bed is about two feet wide, 12 feet long. And what he used was an eight foot tall chain link fence post at either end. And then uh, a uh, uh, post that you can get, a fence top post that you can attach to the chain link fence post. So you put that uh, into the ground a few inches so that it um, supports itself. And then every 18 to 24 inches, uh, put a piece of long twine uh, uh, over the top of the trellis uh, and down to the ground. Uh, you can stake it 
And then you're going to tie the tomato seedling to that. And again, as you uh, prune it and it grows, you're going to continue to attach it to that twine all the way up. Uh, the picture on the right is showing a similar system, but they've uh, placed the poles closer together and they've used wire between the posts and then again used twine tied over the wire uh, to support the tomatoes. So the reason that you would do that is that it allows you to plant them uh, more closely together, uh, keep them looking a little neater, sprawling a little less. Uh, but you've got to prune them to achieve that. If you've got tomatoes in cages, uh, I often use uh, cages. I always prune a little bit, but not as uh, vigorously or as regularly as you would if you're doing staked or trellised tomatoes. If you're doing staked or trellised tomatoes, what you need to be aware of is your tomato plant, if it's an indeterminate, is just going to, this main stem is going to continue to grow up. And that's what you're going to be tying to the stake or uh, to the twine if you're using a trellis. But it also, the tomato at each of these junctures here or here is going to put out a little, what's called a sucker. And if you allow that to grow, it's going to produce another long stem that will uh, eventually grow some side shoots and it'll produce more tomatoes. But if you prune it out when it's young, what you'll be able to achieve is just a single leader like this. And that's why if you are staking or trellising and pruning those tomatoes, you can plant the plants a little closer. Um, if you uh, do that, you're gonna be giving up about 25 to 30% of the tomato production. But remember the trade-off is you've probably been able to fit in one or two additional varieties of tomatoes that will also produce. So net net, you're gonna be better off. If you wanna kind of uh, split the difference, you could allow one of the uh, side shoots to develop and do it as a two liter system, but then you'll need to have a, a separate staking or a separate twine to attach those two. So in a bit, we'll talk about the problems, what can go wrong, but now let's just assume that it's the end of the season. Uh, maybe it's uh, September, October, you really wanna put in a winter garden, the tomatoes aren't producing much anyway, time to get rid of them, what do you do? Well, if you've had healthy plants, what I recommend you do is just cut them off at the soil level, leave the roots in place. Those roots will break down, uh, they'll decompose, it adds organic material to your soils, which is a good thing. Uh, and it will also return nutrients uh, as it breaks down. So if, it, if the plant was healthy, you can do that. The top part, if you have your own compost pile, go ahead and compost it. Um, avoid composting uh, tomatoes though. Uh, I did that and uh, was sorry because uh, in most home compost, uh, the soil doesn't get, or the compost doesn't get hot enough or remain hot enough long enough uh, to, to kill the seeds. They still are viable and they'll germinate. And if you spread it in your gardens, you'll have volunteers coming up all over the place. But the green part can be composted as long as the plants were healthy. If you had diseased plants, you're gonna to want to remove as much debris as possible. All of the top part, the mulch that was underneath them, uh, pull the roots out because you're trying to get rid of uh, the disease pathogens. And we'll talk further about what to look for to know if you've got diseases later on. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about problems now. Uh, here's a problem that um, 
I do a lot of work on the help desk and I have answered this question every year to multiple people, uh, particularly in the last few years where uh, during the pandemic, a lot of people got interested in having gardens and were growing tomatoes for the first time. So they put their seedlings in, the seedlings were growing very well. They had flowers, they waited, they waited, they waited, a couple weeks pass, nothing happens. And then they send off a letter to the help desk. My uh, tomatoes have got lots of blossoms, but no fruit and the blossoms just dry up and fall off. What's, what's the problem? Well, it's probably uh, when it's early in the uh, season, it's probably all about cold temperatures. If the overnight temperatures start falling below 55 degrees, uh, many plant, many tomato varieties are unable to set fruit at those temperatures. Uh, so what do you do about it? Well, uh, at that point, the plants still tend to be fairly small. And if you've got them in a cage, you might be able just to take some row cloth, put it over them, uh, and uh, if you use some of the ones that are uh, sold for frost protection, just put it on at night, it'll raise the temperature around the plant by two or three degrees, and that might make a difference, or just be patient. Other things that can cause it, um, if you notice uh, come August that the same thing is happening, that probably are temperatures that are too hot. If it's routinely getting over 90 degrees uh, uh, day after day, again, many varieties won't set fruit. Uh, things to do about that, again, think about those uh, climate charts that I told you about that UC has. And if you live in the hot areas, you might try some of the uh, varieties that are well suited for those hot climates. Um, insufficient light, if you don't have the eight to 10 hours of sunlight that you need for large tomatoes and at least five or six, even for cherry tomatoes, that can also uh, cause a problem of uh, the blossoms not developing. Then here's one of my water issues. Uh, the bottom of my tomatoes are all brown and I used to have this year after year. It's called blossom end rot. If you just did an internet search to say, what do you do about blossom end rot? You're gonna find lots of people that are gonna tell you that it's a deficiency of calcium and they're gonna to try to sell you products to add calcium to your soil. Save your money. Uh, it is an issue with calcium, but uh, almost always in California, uh, our soils have enough calcium and a good soil mix, uh, potting mix that you use in a container is gonna have adequate calcium. What's really going on here is a water problem. If you've got erratic water, like in my case, when I used to water it, uh, you know, 20 minutes a day, every day, the uh, roots were getting enough uh, water uh, to sustain the plant. It was after all producing fruit, uh, but it, it was uh, drying out in the root zone. And then the next day, it'd get a little bit more of a trickle of water. You really wanna keep more moisture in the root zone, in the root area, uh, because if there's a deficit of moisture, the plant is unable to access the calcium in the soil that it needs. Uh, so it's really all about uh, watering. Be sure you're watering uh, the root zone, test that root zone, uh, use mulch. And don't be tricked into thinking that uh, when you added the product that included calcium, that that made the difference. Sometimes the tomatoes simply outgrow the problem. Uh, but um, if you've uh, had that problem, try doing what I did and adjust your uh, irrigation a bit. Here's another common problem, uh, the leathery looking spots. This is all about sunburn. Uh, and keep in mind, if you're gonna do that heavy pruning that I talked about because you wanna put more uh, tomatoes in the same bed and you're gonna prune heavily, 
uh, there'll be less leaf cover. Uh, if you see your tomatoes uh, are in the hot sunlight, you'll be able to notice it. Uh, try to cover them up uh, with leaves and or put up some shade cloth. You might be able just to drape it over uh, uh, the cages if you're using cages or possibly put it over the stake on the part of the, the side of the tomato, uh, which is uh, getting all the sun. This is something that I noticed happening uh, in my garden at the end of every summer. Uh, I would uh, in July and August go out and pick tons of tomatoes, so many that I ended up having to give them away because I uh, was running out of space in the freezer and getting tired of canning them. Uh, but then all of a sudden the production slowed down. I had lots of green tomatoes. Uh, what's happening? Uh, it's probably at the end of the season, the plants are getting tired. I probably had cut off some uh, diseased growth on the plants. Uh, some of the leaves had died back, less photosynthesis going on. So it's less able to sustain uh, all of the green tomatoes and help uh, ripen them. It also may have to do with heat because temperatures in the uh, high 90s will slow down the production of enzymes that lead to uh, ripening. So what to do about it? If it's at the end of the season, uh, don't think you're going to solve the problem by uh, putting on more fertilizer at that point. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's close enough to the end of the growing season. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier, by the way, that you should probably, once the tomato starts setting fruit, that might be a time when you do some supplemental fertilizer. Uh, again, uh, soil test in the root zone is best uh, to know what it's going to need, but then you can side dress uh, uh, every six to eight weeks during the growing season after it's set its first fruit. But don't plan to do that in September. It's close enough to the end of the season. Better to take off a few of the green tomatoes, ripen them on your counter uh, so that the plant can give all of its energy uh, to ripen the ones you left on. Here's another common problem. The one on the left I see uh, frequently uh, with the cracking around the stem end of the tomato. And what is causing this? Some of it can be water. Um, if your plant has really uh, uh, dried, you might see it in the hot sunlight uh, wilting a bit. And then you say, oh, I probably should give it some supplemental water. And you water it and the plant takes up the water. Some of that goes into the fruit and it uh, can literally make it burst through um, and crack the skin of the tomato. Uh, hot temperatures can also contribute to that problem. So again, consistent watering can help and maybe some shade as well. The one on the right is called cat facing. And this is the opposite problem. Uh, it's not too hot temperatures, it's too cold temperatures. If uh, the tomatoes are setting fruit and it's uh, cold at night, in the, in the 50s, but they're still able to set, that contributes to the, the formation of the cracking uh, called cat facing on the blossom end. Uh, so maybe a little bit of uh, frost protection uh, early in the season uh, at nighttime could help for that. And it also seems to be related to varieties so if you have a lot of problem with a particular variety in cat facing, try a different variety. And now we're gonna uh, look at some tomato pests and we're gonna start by looking at all of the results of the pests. And when all you're seeing is the results, it's difficult to know what caused the problem. The five slides I've just shown you have five different pests. Uh, the first one, the tomato hornworm, uh, the uh, first culprit is the big moth that you see on the right. If you've ever seen one of these in person, 
uh, you might have mistaken it for a hummingbird. That's about the size they are. But I don't frequently see them in my garden. Uh, I did see them on one occasion caught in a big spider web. Uh, but the reason you don't see them is that they tend to be active at night. And what are they doing? They're laying eggs on your tomato plants. And out of those eggs, uh, caterpillars develop. And these caterpillars grow very, very large, two or three inches long, uh, as you see in the center photo. And even their excrement, or called frass, uh, is huge. Um, so um, uh, if you're seeing uh, nibbling and you don't know what's causing it, and particularly if you're seeing some of the frass remains, the excrement remains on the leaves, uh, look closely at your plant and see if you see uh, a, a large caterpillar. Uh, if you do, then you want to hand pick it off, get it out of uh, the tomatoes. You might also at that point look for any kind of uh, eggs that uh, are left over and try to get those off as well. Uh, if you use, if you wanted to use a pesticide, you have to use it when the caterpillar is very, very small. And then you can use uh, BT spray. BT uh, stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. That's the active ingredient. Uh, and uh, when caterpillars uh, eat it, uh, it kills them. So you spray it on your uh, plants, the leaves and the tomatoes because the caterpillars like the tomatoes too. And if they ingest that, well, they're still small enough, it uh, sickens them and uh, controls them. But if they're as big as the one you see here in the photo, the BT spray is probably not gonna do any good and hand picking and just being vigilant is your best approach. This is a, one of the problems I had last year, and it's an example of what I would worry about without uh, having good crop rotation, uh, because the, the moths here are laying eggs on your plant, and out of that, these little caterpillars are uh, hatching, and the caterpillars love to burrow into the tomato. The tomato fruit worm is what it's called. And they feed inside the tomato. Uh, at the, uh, after they've uh, satisfied themselves in terms of growing large enough, they come out of the tomato and then they're going to go into uh, a, a hidden place and do a cocoon and pupate and come out as a moth. Over the winter, they can actually uh, remain in the uh, debris below your plant. That's what, one of the reasons you wanna uh, uh, clean up very carefully. So what to do about this critter? Uh, again, if you got it early enough uh, to either see it before it burrowed in or to spray when you first saw uh, problems, it might help. You could use BT spray again, or if you see eggs, you can hand pick them off. But once the uh, caterpillar is inside the tomato, you can't use any pesticides. It's protected inside there. So what I would do is if you see the kind of damage that is on the red tomato going on, pick that tomato, try to do it before you see an exit hole coming out. Uh, because you want to trap the uh, caterpillar inside, put it in your green bin, get it off your property uh, to slow down the life cycle uh, so it doesn't uh, become a moth and lay more eggs. Uh, here's another culprit that can uh, cause a very similar looking damage to what the uh, hornworm was doing, slugs and snails. Uh, they are active at night. Um, if you're seeing this kind of a problem, you can go out uh, at night with a flashlight. Uh, and if you see them on the plant, hand pick them off uh, and get them off uh, uh, the plant off your property. Uh, you can make traps from them for them. Uh, if you take a, a melon and eat the center part, the part that's good, leave the rind uh, in a, 
uh, half cut open and, and cleared out, put it upside down near your plants. Uh, the slugs and snails are looking for a cool, moist place to hide. So if you go out the next morning and turn it over, uh, you may find them hidden there and you'll be able to get them out of your garden. Uh, you can do the same thing with just an old piece of scrap lumber. They often hide under that as well. And there are uh, baits that you can use. Uh, the one I would uh, suggest you look for as an active ingredient is iron phosphate. Uh, it's available with lots of uh, different trade names like Sluggo or Slug Magic. Uh, it uh, is a safer form of bait to use around children. It won't hurt uh, uh, your pets. Uh, birds won't uh, be hurt if they should get it. Uh, so it's, it's pretty safe and actually can be used in organic gardening. And then uh, this damage, which uh, uh, if you've had our next problem that we're coming to, you might have thought this was something other than birds. But in this case, this damage was caused by birds. Unless you see the birds uh, actively there on your plants, you may not know uh, what kind of bird it is. Uh, finches and sparrows are both possibilities. Uh, if you see this going on, and in particular, if you notice birds coming back to perch on your tomatoes and peck at them, you might want to get some uh, bird screen mesh and just uh, put it over uh, the tomatoes. If you've got cages, uh, that'll help support it, or uh, the stakes might uh, be able to support it as well. You're just trying to keep the birds from being able to get close to the tomatoes. And then this is the culprit that lots of us in our county are very unhappy uh, that we see this damage year after year. Sometimes the rats will eat the tomato while it's still hanging on the plant. Uh, sometimes I find them carrying it away. Um, if you've got a rat problem, uh, be sure that you're doing nothing to attract them uh, apart from raising your tomatoes. Uh, don't leave uh, uh, bird food around or pet food around, for example but then you're probably uh, best off using traps. And my recommendation is just to do an internet search, say controlling rats, comma, uh, UC IPM. That will give you the University of California's integrated pest management site. And it has good recommendations on what kind of traps to use and how to place them. And it'll talk about other possibilities, including things like poison. You just have to be very careful if you uh, consider poisons at all, because uh, they're a risk to children, they're a risk to pets, to birds, and even to scavengers who may find the rat that ate the poison and eat the rat. The owls and the hawks, for example. Uh, can be killed by the poison. So uh, think carefully before you use that kind of an approach. And then the final pest we're going to talk about, um, if you see these kind of little yellow spots on your tomato and wonder what it is, in this case, it's not a sunburn, it's feeding damage. Um, it, you might have stink bugs. Uh, stink bugs look similar to the uh, uh, photo in the center, but they can come in a wide variety of different colors and patterns, uh, not just these green ones, uh, but they lay their eggs on the leaves of your tomatoes uh, and uh, in clusters. So they're actually quite visible. So if you find any stink bugs uh, or you see this damage, look for the stink bugs. Uh, easiest approach is to handpick them and their eggs off the plant to control it. And now a uh, few words about uh, problems. This first one uh, is Fusarium or Verticillium wilt. This is what you are most at risk for uh, if you are not able to do good crop rotation. If it gets introduced into your soils, it's virtually impossible for a home gardener to get rid of it. 
Uh, it lasts for years and years. Um, and unfortunately, it feeds not only on the tomatoes and peppers, uh, but they can also uh, uh, be hosted by other uh, garden vegetables. So um, it's, it can be a pretty uh, bad disease to get. It's called a wilt disease because it actually will make your plants look like they're not getting enough water, even though you know that you're providing adequate irrigation. If you see something like that going on, Here's the way to diagnose it. Uh, take a stem of the tomato, uh, cut it open, and if you see the brown color that you see in this one, that is a sign that you've got either fusarium or verticillium wilt. Um, it uh, is affecting the vascular system of the plant, which moves the, uh, the sugars and the water, et cetera, throughout the plant. And the plant is wilting because it's no longer able to move the uh, necessary moisture throughout the plant. So this is the telltale sign uh, of either Vusarium or Verticillium wilt. Um, it's probably you don't need to necessarily know which it is. You won't be able to diagnose it in the field. If you really need to know, you'd have to send your plant off to a lab for testing. Uh, but what do you do um, if you have this problem? One thing I would suggest is at the end of every growing season, uh, when you take your tomatoes out, cut into the stems and look for it to see if you might have a developing problem. Uh, that will at least alert you uh, to the situation. And if you've got this problem, you're gonna to wanna to use hybrid tomatoes uh, that have some uh, resistance to wilt diseases. If you look at the plant labels or if you look at your seed packages, they typically have codes on them uh, saying what disease resistance is uh, available in that particular variety. And for verticillium, you look for a V, for Fusarium, you look for an F. Uh, you can go to this Cornell website. And again, I put a QR code on if you wanna snap a picture of it. It'll take you to a site where you first register as a user. It's a simple process to do that. But then that gives you access to really wonderful information that Cornell University has, including a long list of uh, disease resistance for tomatoes, but lots of other vegetables. So because verticillium and uh, fusarium wilt can affect um, even things like your squashes, if you've got that problem, you might want to make use of that website to find uh, varieties that you can grow that would have some resistance to the wilt problem. And then moving on, Here's two more uh, fungal diseases. Uh, the septorial leaf spot on the left, if you get lots of little spots uh, on the tomato, starting at the bottom uh, part of the tomato, suspect that it might be septorial leaf spot. Uh, the one on the right has an easier diagnosis because these little cylindrical areas that you see on the leaves are a telltale sign of early blight. Uh, the septorial leaf spot doesn't usually affect the uh, quality of the tomatoes, but it's going to kill the leaves, so it's going to weaken your plant. The early blight can affect both the leaves and some of the tomatoes. Uh, there are some uh, resistant varieties for the blight, but not for septoria leaf spot. If you see this kind of a problem, what to do about it? Well, be aware that it spreads with splashing water. So best not to use any kind of um, a watering system that sprays your tomatoes. It can move it from one part of the plant to another or between your plants. Uh, so uh, try to use a different watering system that doesn't uh, wet the leaves of the plant. And then all of the uh, leaves and the fruits that you see showing signs of the disease, 
as soon as you notice it, get it out of the garden so that the spores don't develop and spread. And this is one that at the end of the season, you'd want to be real thorough about uh, cleanup, get all of the mulch, et cetera, uh, out of the garden off of your property so that you're not uh, keeping the uh, disease pathogen uh, in your garden beds. And then the final uh, disease we're going to talk about, these are, uh, they also cause the spotting on the leaves and uh, affect the tomatoes themselves, bacterial speck and bacterial spot. Uh, the treatment for this is much like the fungal diseases we just talked about. Uh, when you see it developing, get those leaves uh, off the plants, out of your garden. Uh, if the tomatoes themselves are affected, uh, get those off the plant. Uh, and again, avoid sprays that can also spread this, uh, any kind of water spray. Um, and then these uh, can actually uh, uh, be maintained in the seeds that develop inside the tomatoes. You might get tomatoes that show no outside blemishing or problems, uh, but the seeds may carry the bacteria. So if you've had plants that have this problem, don't save seeds. Uh, don't let volunteers come up because uh, the seeds themselves can spread it to the next plant. 